All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're going to take Matthew chapter 26, and we're going to see the stage is going to be set for the arrest and crucifixion of Jesus. All right, so let's just jump right into the first two verses where Jesus is going to remind his disciples of his coming, suffering, and crucifixion. Okay, verse 1. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, that he would said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. So in Matthew's Gospel, the teaching of Jesus is finished here. In these last days leading up to his betrayal and crucifixion, he warned the multitudes about the corrupt religious leadership, and he spoke to his disciples about the things to come. Now it was time for Jesus to fulfill his work on the cross. So having instructed his disciples and the Jews by his discourses, edified them by his example, convinced them by his miracles, he now is going to prepare to redeem them by his blood. And so perhaps after the triumphal descriptions of the coming kingdom, the disciples were strengthened in their idea that it was impossible that the Messiah should suffer. And Jesus reminded them that this was not the case. All right, verses 3 through 5, the plot against Jesus. Verse 3, Then the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest, who was called Cephas, and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. But they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. And what we'll notice right off the bat here, palace of the high priest. What is a priest doing with a palace? Right? They were obviously very wealthy. And so Siaphas is a Roman appointee. Uh, Annas was actually the uh, ironic heir to that role, but the Romans had entrenched the politics of that day. And so Siaphas is the power figure on the Jewish side. And Passover was one of the three feasts which was required for every able-bodied male to celebrate it in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem at this time would be crowded with strangers and tourists. And so the long controversy between Jesus and the religious leaders had finally come to this. It all came to this head now. And according to Carson, the use of both assembled and plotted is deliberately suggestive of Psalm 31 verse 13, where it says, For I am the slander of many. Fear is on every side. While they take counsel together against me, they scheme to take away my life. And so, Annas was deposed by the secular authorities in 15 AD, and he was replaced by Cephas, uh, who lived and ruled till his death in 36 AD. But since, according to the Old Testament, the high priest was not to be replaced till after his death, the transfer of power here was illegal. Doubtless, some continued to call either man the high priest. And so, between 37 BC and 67 AD, there was no fewer than 28 high priests. The suggestive thing is that Cephas was high priest from 18 to 36 AD, and this was an extraordinarily long time for a high priest to last, and Cephas must have brought the technique of cooperating with the Romans down to this fine art. And so about two years after our Lord's crucifixion, Cephas and Pilate were both deposed by Vitulius. Uh, then he was the governor of Syria, and afterwards the emperor. And so Cephas, who was unable to bear this disgrace and the stings of his conscience for the murder of Christ, he killed himself about 35 AD. And you can Joseph um, writes about that in the Antiquities. Josephus. <clears throat> the Jewish historian. And so they didn't want to put Jesus to death during the Passover, but that is exactly how it happened. And this is another subtle indication that Jesus was in control of the events, as they in fact killed him on the very day that they didn't want to. And so the leaders were right in fearing the people. Jerusalem's population swelled perhaps fivefold during this feast time. And with the religious fervor and the national uh, messianism at a this messianic uh, praise from the nation was at a high pitch and so a spark might set off an explosion with the population 
All right, verses 6 through 13, a woman is going to anoint Jesus before his death. Verse 6, and when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. But when Jesus was aware of it he said to them why do you trouble the woman for she has done a good work for me for you have the poor with you always but me you do not always have or you do not have always for in pouring this fragrant oil on my body she did it for my burial and assuredly I say to you wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world that this woman has done will be uh, will also be told as a memorial to her so Bethany had a very unique distinction of being within a Sabbath day journey from Jerusalem. And it appears to be Jesus' favorite place to stay. And so this feast at Bethany took place about six days before the Passover. We find that out in John 12, verse 1. And in the house of Simon the leper, apparently he had been healed by the Lord Jesus. And so there were at least 17 people at this dinner. There were Simon, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, Jesus, and the twelve apostles. And so true to her character, as the doer in the family, Martha did the serving, as outlined in Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42. And so the three key persons in this event are Mary, Judas, and Jesus. And so only John is going to identify this woman as Mary, who is the sister of Martha and Lazarus. She is found only three times in the Gospels, and in each instance, she is at the feet of Jesus. She sat at his feet and listened to the word in Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42. She came to his feet in sorrow after the death of Lazarus in John chapter 11, and she worshiped at his feet when she anointed him with the ointment in John chapter 12. And so Mary was a deeply spiritual woman she found at his feet her blessing she brought to his feet her burdens and she gave at his feet her best and so ointment would presumably be myrrh and you'll remember the three gifts that the wise men brought to, to Jesus at his birth and this particular ointment could have been sold for about 300 denarii and a denarii was a minimum day's wage therefore basically 300 man's day uh, 300 days of labor and so it's very expensive stuff and so this gift to him makes us realize that she understood his prediction. Somehow she assembled this enormous amount of savings to buy this unique and symbolic gift. And here it notes that she anointed his head. In John, it notes his feet. This is not contradictory. She did both. Matthew is going to emphasize the Lord's kingship. So it's his head. While John is going to emphasize the Lord's deity, so he emphasizes the fact that she anointed his feet. Right? Those are complementary insights there. And so gifts at his birth, uh, they're not necessarily all mentioned. These mentioned because they are prophetic. You have gold, speaking of his deity, frankincense, speaking of his priesthood, um, which was mixed into the showbread by the priest, and myrrh, when crushed, it was an ointment for burial. And so it spoke to him being a prophet, priest, and king. And in the millennium, we will find from the book of Isaiah that he is given gifts, only gold and frankincense, uh, frankincense. There's no myrrh because his death is behind him. And you can find that in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 6. And so Jesus is going to explain to the disciples why Mary anointed him. Right? And Mary always seems to be misunderstood. Her sister Martha misunderstood her when Mary sat at Jesus' feet to hear him teach the word in Luke chapter 10. Judas and the other disciples misunderstood her when she anointed Jesus here in Matthew chapter 26. And her friends and neighbors misunderstood her when she came out of the house to meet Jesus after Lazarus had been buried in John chapter 11. So when we give Jesus Christ first place in our lives, we can expect to be misunderstood and criticized by those who claim to follow him. I think that's very important. 
And so <clears throat> we know from John 12 that that woman was Mary, the sister of Lazarus and Martha. And uh, Mary sat at the feet of Jesus in Luke 10. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word and made this extravagant display of love and devotion to Jesus. And there is uh, some measure of debate and sometimes confusion about the anointing of Jesus and those mentioned in Mark, Luke, and John. The best solution seems to be that Matthew, Mark, and John record one occasion of anointing in Bethany. And Luke is going to record of a separate event in Galilee. And so Simon the leper is otherwise unknown to us. He was presumably a well-known local figure and perhaps one whom Jesus had cured as one who was still a leper could not entertain guests for dinner, but whose nickname remained as a reminder of his former disease. And so this alabaster flask had no handles and it was furnished with a long neck which was broken off when the contents were needed. All right, so it's like a one-time use. So we may fairly deduce that this perfume was costly. Jewish ladies commonly wore a perfume flask suspended from a cord around the neck. And it was so much a part of them that they were allowed to wear it on the Sabbath. And so why this waste? The disciples criticized this display of love and honor for Jesus. Specifically, this critic was Judas in John 12, verses 4 through 6, where it says... But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Right? But Jesus defends Mary as an example of someone who simply did a good work for him, God. Her extravagant and reckless really giving for Jesus would be remembered as long as the gospel was preached as a memorial to her. And so what they call waste, Jesus calls a beautiful thing. Okay, and so <clears throat> Jesus said, you have the poor with you always, but me you don't always have. Um, you don't always have with you. And so Jesus did not say this to discourage generosity and kind treatment of the poor. In fact, his recent words about the judgment of the nations had just radically encouraged kindness to those in need in Matthew 25, verse 31 through 46. So Jesus pointed to the appropriate nature of that moment to honor him in an extravagant way. And so the beauty of this woman's act consisted in this, that it was all for Christ. And all who were in the house could perceive and enjoy the perfume of the precious ointment, but the anointing was for Jesus only. And so she did it for his burial. And even though she did not understand the full significance of what she did, Mary's act said something that the disciples did not say or do. She gave Jesus the love and attention he deserved before his great suffering. She understood it more because she was in a place of greatest understanding being at the feet of Jesus. And so kings were anointed, priests were also anointed, and each of these um, would have been true in the case of Jesus. Yet he claimed that she anointed him for his burial. And she probably did not know that all, uh, everything that her action meant when she anointed her Lord for his burial. The consequence of the most simple action done for Christ may be much greater than we think. And thus, she showed that there was at least one heart in the world that thought nothing was too good for her Lord and that the best of the very best ought to be given to him. And is that true in our own lives? Are we giving God our best? Uh, frequently not the case. The world gets in the way. But we have to be cautious of that and lean in to give God our best. And so... <clears throat> What Mary did was remarkable for its motive, which was a pure, loving heart. It was remarkable in that it was done for Jesus alone, and it was remarkable in that it was unusual and extraordinary. Verses 14 through 16, Judas is going to make a sinister agreement with the religious leaders. Verse 14, Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him thirty pieces of silver. So from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. And so the sense from Matthew is that the matter with Mary was the final insult to Judas. Even though it might have happened some days before, after that he was determined to betray Jesus to the religious leaders who wanted to kill him. 
And through the centuries, many suggestions have been offered regarding the motive of Judas in betraying Jesus. Because in Matthew chapter 10, verse 4, uh, it's going to call him Judas Iscariot. That it may be that he was from Kerioth, which was a city in southern Judea. And this would make Judas the only Judean among the other disciples, who were all Galileans. And some wonder if Judas resented the leadership of the Galilean fishermen among the disciples, and he finally had enough of it. Or, perhaps Judas was disillusioned with the type of Messiah that Jesus revealed himself to be, wanting a more political conquering Messiah. So maybe what he was trying to do was put Jesus in this place. If I hand him over to the authorities, he'll be forced to deal with the Roman problem, right? And he will figure it out. Uh, perhaps Judas watched the ongoing conflict between Jesus and the religious leaders and concluded that, you know, they were winning and Jesus, Jesus was losing and therefore he decided to cut his losses and join the winning side. That could also be the case. Uh, perhaps he came to the conclusion that Jesus simply was not the Messiah or the true prophet, even as the Saul of Tarsus had believed, who would later become Paul. Uh, some even suggest that Judas did this from a noble motive, that he was impatient for Jesus to reveal himself as a powerful Messiah, and he thought that this would force him to do this, as I previously mentioned. Uh, whatever the specific reason was, the scriptures present no sense of reluctance in Judas. Okay, so let's just let the text say what it says. And there's only one motivation given, which was agreed. And the words stand, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? All right, and so according to the Bible, there was no noble intention in Judas's heart. His motive was simply money, and his price wasn't too high. 30 pieces of silver was worth perhaps $25. Uh, the exact value of 30 pieces of silver is somewhat difficult to determine, but it was undeniably a small amount, not a great amount, and it was a, a known set price for the basis slave. In Exodus 21, it'll say that if an ox gores a male or a female servant, he shall give to their master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned, right? They would have to replace the slave that was killed by the ox. They'd be able to purchase a new one. And in Joel um, chapter 3, verse 3, and verse 6 as well. And so for so small a sum sold this trader so sweet a master. And so <clears throat> verse 17 through 20, we're going to see preparations for the Passover, remembering redemption. Verse 17, now on the first day of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. And so this must have been a very moving commemoration for Jesus. Passover is going to remember the deliverance of Israel from Egypt, the Exodus account. And so this was the central act of redemption in the Old Testament. And so Jesus is providing a new center of redemption to be remembered by a new ceremonial meal. And this mention of the first day of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread is going to bring up complicated issues of the precise calendar chronology of these events. The main complicating issue is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are going to present this meal that Jesus will have with his disciples as a Passover meal, normally eaten with lamb, which was sacrificed on the day of Passover with great ceremony at the temple. Yet John seems to indicate that the meal took place before the Passover, in John 13, verse 1, now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, and so forth, uh, and that Jesus was actually crucified on the Passover. In John 18, verse 28, where it says, Then they led Jesus from Siaphis to the Praetorium, and it was early morning, but they themselves did not go into the Praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but, they, but that they might uh, be at the Passover. 
And so another solution is suggested by Adam Clark, uh, where, where he says, It's a common opinion that our Lord ate the Passover some hours before the Jews ate it. For the Jews, according to custom, ate theirs at the end of the 14th day. But Christ ate his at the preceding uh, even which was at the be- uh, beginning of the same sixth day or Friday. The Jews began their day at sunsetting, we at midnight. Thus Christ ate the Passover on the same day with the Jews, but not on the same hour. And so the simplest solution is that Jesus, knowing that he was going to be dead before the regular time for the meal, deliberately held it in secret one day early. Uh, Luke 22, verse 15 and 16 will indicate Jesus' strong desire for such a meal with his disciples before his death, and his awareness of that time was short. And so one is inclined to agree with Bruce regarding precise uh, chronological analysis. The discussions are irksome, and the results are uncertain, uh, and they are apt to take the attention off far more important matters. And so, since the Jewish day began at sundown, and that's important for us to know. That goes all the way back to Genesis, Genesis with the evening and the morning were the first day, Erev and Boker. And so in the Jewish mind, the Jewish day began at sundown. That may be strange to our Western ears, but if we're familiar with the Old Testament, it won't, so, it won't seem so strange to us. And so Jesus ate the Passover and was killed on the same day according to the Jewish calendar. And so... If it is true that Jesus ate this at the beginning of the Jewish day, the evening, when most Jews would normally eat the Passover at the end of the day, following the night and the morning, it explains why there's no mention of Jesus eating lamb with his disciples at this meal. They ate it before the Passover lambs were sacrificed at the temple. This would correspond with John's um, chronology that indicates that Jesus was crucified at the same approximate time the Passover lambs were being sacrificed. Why? Because he is our Passover lamb. And so, however, it'd be wrong to say that there were no Passover lamb at this uh, last supper that Jesus had with his disciples. He was the Passover lamb. Paul would later refer to Christ as our Passover was sacrificed for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. And so he sat down with the twelve, with Judas among the rest, though Hillary told otherwise, for what reason I know not. All right, verse 21 through 25, Judas or Jesus is going to give Judas a last opportunity to repent. Verse 21. Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? And he said to him, You've said it. And so in the midst of their Passover meal, Jesus made a startling announcement. He told his disciples that one of their own, these 12 who had lived and heard and learned from Jesus for three years, would betray him. And if we are familiar with this story, it's easy not to appreciate its impact. It's easy to lose appreciation for how terrible it was for one of Jesus' own to betray him. One of his own and an insider at that. And so for good reason... Dante's great poem about heaven and hell will place Judas in the lowest places of hell, in the mouth of Satan. And of course, Dante's Inferno is a you know fictional poem about heaven and hell, but Dante will place Judas right in the mouth of uh, Satan in the depths of hell, right there with Hitler and some of the other uh, infamous dictators of, of history, if I remember right from Dante's Inferno. <clears throat> and so Jesus said, you know, he who dipped his hand in this with me in this dish will betray me. And so Jesus said this not to point out the dis, uh, the specific disciple because they all dipped with him. Instead, Jesus identified the betrayer as a friend, someone who ate at the same table as him. And this idea is drawn from Psalm 41 verse 9 where it says, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. 
And in Psalm 41, verse 9, I'll we'll say, my fellow commoner, my fellow friend. And so this greatly aggravated the indignity of the matter. And so it's noble for the 11 other disciples to ask that question, Lord, is it me? You know, is it I? It's a terrible hypocrisy for Judas to ask it. For Judas to ask, Rabbi, is it I? While knowing that he had already arranged for the rest of Jesus was the height of treachery. And so Jesus did not say this to condemn Judas, right? You've said it. But to call him to repentance. It's fair to assume that he said it with love in his eyes. And Jesus showed Judas that he loved him, even already knowing his treachery. Verse 26 through 29. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many of the remissions of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And so sometime during or after this dinner, Jesus washed the disciples' feet. That's in John 13, verse 1 through 11. Following that, Judas left in John 13, verse 30. Then Jesus gave the extended discourse with his disciples in prayer to God uh, the Father, which is described in John 13, verse 31 through John 17, verse 26. And so was Judas present for the first celebration of the Lord's Supper? The debate is going to center on the manuscript of John 13, verse 2. There are some textual traditions that will say, um, and supper being ended, which would imply that Jesus washed their feet and that Judas left after the institution of the Lord's Supper. Other Textual traditions will read, and during supper at John 13, verse 2. This would indicate that Jesus washed feet and Judas left sometime during the meal, and therefore might have left before the institution of the Lord's Supper. And so since John did not describe the institution of the Lord's Supper in his gospel account, there is debate as to if Judas was present when the Lord's Supper was first given, as described in that following passage. And most confidently, um, most are going to confidently believe that Judas was not part of this um, part of the Lord's Supper, uh, such as Morgan, who will say, before the new feast was instituted, Judas had gone out in John 13, verse 30. And so this issue is very difficult to determine with certainty. It's a minor detail, but I just want to bring it to your attention. And so the New Testament is equivalent with the New Covenant. The Lord's Supper is going to remind us to look ahead for Christ's return. We will observe this supper until he comes. And 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26 will direct us on that. And the Passover pointed ahead to the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. In John 1, 29. And so the Lord's Supper announces that this great work has been accomplished past tense. And so bread and wine, Melchizedek used it with Abraham in Genesis 14 verse 18. You had Joseph's prophetic interpretations, the wine steward in Genesis 40 verse 10 and the baker. Uh, You have the bread of life in John 6 and you have the wine at Cana in John 2. And so In Exodus 6, verses 6 and 7, we'll say, Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage. I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments, and I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians." And so the four cups of Passover is you have the cup of bringing out, the cup of delivery, the cup of redemption and blessing, and the cup of taking out. And so it is the third cup, the cup of blessing in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 16 that Jesus does this with. This Passover is unfinished. You'll note verse 29. This will be finished at the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is going to occur more towards the tribulation end of history. And so Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it. And when the bread was lifted up at Passover, 
The head of the meal said, This is the bread of the affliction which our fathers ate in the land of Egypt. Let everyone who hungers come and eat. Let everyone who is needy come and eat at the Passover meal. Everything eaten at the Passover meal had a symbolic meaning. The bitter herbs recalled the bitterness of slavery. The salt water remembered the tears shed under Egypt's oppression. In the main course of the meal, which was a lamb freshly sacrificed for that particular household, did not symbolize anything connected to the agonies of Egypt. It was the sin-bearing sacrifice that allowed the judgment of God to pass over the household that believed. And so the Passover created a nation. A mob of slaves were freed from Egypt and became a nation. And so this new Passover also creates a people, those united in Jesus Christ, who would remember and trust his sacrifice. And so he says, take, eat, this is my body, and this is my blood of the new covenant. And if anybody that's taken a part of the Lord's Supper will remember these familiar words. And so Jesus didn't give the normal explanation of the meaning of each of the foods. He reinterpreted them in himself. And the focus was no longer on the suffering of Israel in Egypt, but on the sin-bearing suffering of Jesus on their behalf. And so the words, this is my body, had no place in the Passover ritual. And and as an uh, innovation, they must have had a uh, stunning effect, an effect that would grow with the increased understanding gained after Easter. And so this is how we remember what Jesus did for us. As we eat the bread, we should remember how Jesus was broken, pierced, and beaten with stripes for our own redemption. As we drink the cup, we should remember that his blood, his life, was poured out on Calvary for us. And so this is how we fellowship with Jesus. Because his redemption has reconciled us to God, we can now sit down to a meal with Jesus and enjoy each other's company. And so he said, this is my blood of the new covenant. Remarkably, Jesus announced the institution of the new covenant. No mere man could institute a new covenant between God and man. But Jesus is the God-man, and he had the authority to establish a new covenant sealed with blood, even as the old covenant was sealed with blood in Exodus 24, verse 8. And so the new covenant is going to concern an inner transformation that cleanses us from all sin. All right. Jeremiah 31 verse 34 will say, For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. This transformation puts God's word and will in us. Jeremiah 31 verse 33 will say, I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts. And this covenant is all about a new and a close relationship with God. Where he says in verse 33, I will be their God and they shall be my people. And so we can say that the blood of Jesus made the new covenant possible. And it also made it sure and reliable. It is confirmed with the life of God himself. And so because of what Jesus did on the cross, we can have a new covenant relationship with God. Sadly, many followers of Jesus live as if it had never happened. As if there was no inner transformation. As if there was no true cleansing from sin. As if there is no word and will of God in our hearts. And as if there is no new and close relationship with God. Watch out for that. And so... <clears throat> This is my body, this is my blood. The precise understanding of these words from Jesus have been the source of great theological controversy among Christians. The Roman Catholic Church holds the idea of transubstantiation, which is going to teach that the bread and wine are actually become the real body and blood of Jesus. Martin, uh, Martin Luther held the idea of consubstantiation, which teaches the bread remains bread and the wine remains wine, but by faith they are the same as Jesus' actual body. Luther did not believe in the Roman Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation, but he didn't go too far away from it. John Calvin, on the other hand, taught that Jesus' presence in the bread and wine is real, but it's only spiritual, not physical. Uh, Zwingli 
taught that the bread and wine are significant symbols that represent the body and blood of Jesus. And when the Swiss reformers debated the issue with Martin Luther at Marburg, there was a huge contention, and Luther insisted on some kind of physical presence because Jesus said, this is my body. He insisted over and over again, writing it on the velvet of the table. Uh, he said, this is my body in Latin. And Zwingli replied, Jesus also said, I am the vine, I am the door, but we understand what he is saying. And Luther replied, I don't know, but if Christ told me to eat dung, I would do it knowing that it was good for me. And Luther was so strong on this because he saw it as an issue of believing Christ's words and because he thought Zwingli was compromising. So he said he was of another spirit. Under Christ. Ironically, Luther later read Calvin's writings on the Lord's Supper, which were essentially the same as Zwingli's, and seemed to agree with or at least accept Calvin's views. I just bring that up for your awareness. There are different uh, takes on it. And so scripturally, we can understand that the bread and the cup are not just symbols, but they're powerful pictures to partake of, to enter into as we see the Lord's t uh, table as the new Passover. And so let the Papists and Lutherans say what they can. Here must be two figures acknowledged in these words. The cup here is put for the wine in the cup. In the meaning of these words, this is my blood of the New Testament, must be this wine is the sign of the New Covenant. Why they should not as readily acknowledge a figure in these words, this is my body, I cannot understand. Right, And so what is certain is that Jesus bids us commemorate not his birth or his life nor his miracles, but to commemorate his death. And so take and eat. Beyond the debate over what the bread and cup mean, we must remember what Jesus said to do with them. We must take and eat. And take means that we won't be forced upon, uh, it's not going to be forced upon anybody. One must actually receive it. Eat means that this is absolutely vital for everyone. Because without food and drink, nobody can live. Without Jesus, we totally perish. It also means that we must take Jesus into our innermost being. Everyone must also eat for themselves. No one can do it for them. I've tried it with my toddlers. It's impossible. And so he gave thanks. In the ancient Greek language, thanks is the word um, Eucharist. We, and uh, this is why the commemoration of the Lord's table is sometimes called the Eucharist. And so this tells us something of Jesus' own attitude and heart at this very moment. Observe, Jesus was in the mood and able at that hour to thank and praise, confident that good would come out of evil. In Gethsemane, he was able only to submit. And so this is going to tell us something of our own receiving of the Lord's Supper. What then do we mean when at the supper we lift that sacred cup to our lips? Are we not saying by that significant act, remember thy covenant? Are we not reminding Jesus that we are relying upon him to do his part? Are we not pledging ourselves to him as his own, bound to him by in uh, dissoluble ties and satisfied with his most blessed service? And so this is going to tell us something of the uh, sometimes declined condition of the people of God and their leaders. Once there were wooden cups and golden priests, now there's golden cups and wooden priests. And until that day when I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. So Jesus is looking forward to a future celebration of the Passover in heaven. One that he has not celebrated with his people. He is waiting for all of his people to be gathered to him, and then there will be a great supper, the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is in Revelation 19, verse 9. This is the fulfillment in my Father's kingdom that Jesus longed for. Verse 30. Jesus is going to sing with his disciples and go out to the Mount of Olives. And when they sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. 
All right. And so we don't often think of Jesus singing, but he did. He lifted up his voice in adoration and worship of, uh, to God the Father, and we can endlessly wonder what his voice sounded like. But we know for certain that he sang with more than just his voice. He lifted up his whole heart in praise, which is going to remind us that God wants to be praised with singing. And so it's remarkable that Jesus could sing on this night before his crucifixion. Could we sing knowing that those circumstances were in front of us? Jesus can truly be our worship leader, and we should sing to God our Father just as Jesus did, because this is something that pleases him, and when we love someone, we want to do the things that please him. It really doesn't matter if it does or doesn't please us. And so, it's, a, it's wonderful that Jesus sang, but what did he sing? And a Passover meal always ended with singing three psalms, which are known as the Hallel Psalms, 116 through 118. And you can think of how the words of these psalms would have ministered to Jesus as he sang them on the night before his crucifixion. Uh, Psalm 116 will read, The pains of death surrounded me, and the pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. Uh, Psalm 116, verse 8 9 will say, For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. And I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. And uh, Psalm 116, verse 13 and 15 will say, I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord and I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all of his people precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints Psalm 116 verses 13 through 15 and so <clears throat> it also say in uh, Psalm 117 praise the Lord all you Gentiles loud him all you peoples Psalm 118 will say, You pushed me violently that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. <clears throat> Psalm 118 will also say, I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, and I will go through them, and I will praise the Lord. And in Psalm 118, verse 22 and 23, it will say, The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Continuing on, uh, God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. All right. So when Jesus arose to go to Gethsemane, Psalm 118 was upon his lips, and it provided an appropriate description of how God would guide his Messiah through distress and suffering to glory. Verse 31 through 35, Jesus is going to predict the desertion of the disciples. Verse 31, Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly I say to you that this night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. So Jesus said this not to condemn his disciples, but to show them that he was really in command of the situation and to demonstrate that the scriptures regarding the suffering of the Messiah must be fulfilled. And after I have been raised, Jesus was already uh, was looking beyond the cross after I have been raised. His eyes were set on the joy set before him, Hebrews 12:2. And so Peter was tragically unaware of both the spiritual reality and the spiritual battle that Jesus clearly saw. So Peter felt brave at the moment and had no perception beyond that moment. But soon Peter would be intimidated before a little humble servant girl. And before her, Peter would deny that he even knew Jesus at all. And so 
Jesus knew that Peter would fail in what he thought was his strong area, which was courage and boldness, as was often the case with Peter up to this point. And so though through this solemn warning, Jesus gave Peter an opportunity to take heed and to consider his own weakness. Do we do the same thing? Do we consider our own weaknesses? We all have them. And so, even if I... Jesus said it so clearly to Peter. Peter, you're going to be made to stumble. You're going to forsake me, your master. You're going to do this very night before the rooster crows. You're going to deny that you have any association with me or even know me. And you won't only do it once. You're going to do it three times. Was this warning enough to him not to trust in his own strength, but to to depend on God? And so... It was an opportunity that Peter didn't use. Instead, he said, if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so Jesus knew Peter far better than Peter knew himself. And in overestimating himself, Peter was ready for a fall. And so the rest of the disciples also overestimated their strength and did not rely on the Lord in the critical hour, right? Because it says, and so said all the disciples. And apparently it's usual for roosters in Palestine to crow about 12.30, 1.30, and 2.30 a.m. So the Romans gave the term cock crow uh, to the watch between 12 and 3 Um, a.m. All right, verse 36 to 39. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And so Jesus was disturbed in part from knowing the physical horror that was waiting for him at the cross. And so as he came to Gethsemane from central Jerusalem, he crossed the brook Kidron and saw in the full moon of Passover the stream flowing red with the sacrificial blood from the temple. And so the words in the Greek are expressive of the greatest sorrow imaginable. And so he says, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. But more so, Jesus was distressed at the spiritual horror waiting for him on the cross. Jesus would stand in the place of guilty sinners and receive all the spiritual punishment that sinners deserve. He who knew no sin would be sin for us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And so, it's a, rather, it's a rather weak translation for a phrase which contains Matthew's favorite word for violent emotion, even shock, exceedingly sorrowful. And so, Jesus did not die as a martyr. Jesus went to his death knowing that it was his Father's will that he faced death completely alone. And we find that out in Matthew 27, verse 46, as the sacrificial wrath-averting Passover lamb. And so, as his death was unique... So also his anguish and our best response to, uh, to it is a hushed worship, as per Carson. And so, yet in this hour of special agony, God the Father sent special help to his Son. And Luke 22, verse 43, will say that angels came and ministered to Jesus in the garden. And he says, if it is possible, and of course there is a sense in which all things are possible with God, because Matthew 19, verse 26, will state, But Jesus looked at them and said to them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Yet this is true only in a sense, because there are things that are morally impossible for God. It is impossible for God to lie. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, we'll say that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. And it's also impossible to please God without faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, which says, But without faith it's impossible to please him, who? God. For he who comes to God must believe that he, God, is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. 
Are you diligently seeking after him? And so it was not morally possible for God to atone for sin and redeem lost humanity apart from the perfect wrath-satisfying sacrifice that Jesus prepared himself for in Gethsemane. And so God the Father would never deny the Son any request because Jesus prayed according to the heart and will of the Father. And so since Jesus drank the cup of judgment at the cross, we know that it is not possible for salvation to come any other way. Salvation by the work of Jesus at the cross is the only possible way, period. If there, were only other, if there was any other way, to get right before God, then Jesus died an unnecessary death. And so repeatedly in the Old Testament, a uh, cup is a powerful picture of the wrath and judgment of God. Psalm 75 verse 8 will say, For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It's fully mixed, and he pours it out. And surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink uh, down. And Isaiah 51 verse 17 will say, Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, for you have drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury, and you have drunk the dregs of the cup of trembling and drained it out. And Jeremiah 25 verse 15 will say, For thus says the Lord God of Israel to me, Take this wine cup of fury from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. And so Jesus became, as it were, an enemy of God who was judged and forced to drink the cup of the Father's fury so we would not have to drink from that cup. This was the source of Jesus' agony. The cup did not represent death. It represented judgment. Jesus was unafraid of death. And when he had finished his work on the cross, the work of receiving and bearing and satisfying the righteous judgment of God the Father upon our sin, when he finished that work, he simply yielded himself to death as his choice. And so Jesus came to a point of a decision in Gethsemane. It wasn't that he had not decided before or had not consented before, but now he had came upon a unique point of decision. He drank the cup at Calvary, but he decided once and for all to drink it at Gethsemane. Verse 40 through 46. Jesus is going to win the battle of prayer. Then he came to the disciples and found them asleep and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And so he, so he left them, went away again, and prayed a third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And so Jesus valued and desired the help of his friends in this battle of prayer and decision. But even without their help, he endured in prayer until the battle was won. Uh, but they not only um, not helped him, but they wounded him by their dullness to duty. And instead of wiping off his bloody sweat, they drew more out of him, in effect. And so Jesus knew that Peter would fail, yet he encouraged him to victory, knowing that the resources were found in watching and praying. So if Peter woke up, both physically and spiritually, and drew close in dependence on God, he could have kept from denying Jesus at the critical hour. And so <clears throat> Jesus found victory at the cross by succeeding in the struggle in Gethsemane. Peter is just like us. He failed in later temptation because he failed to watch and pray. The spiritual battle is often won or lost before the crisis comes. And so speaking kindly about his disciples, Jesus said, The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so the master might find an excuse for their neglect, but oh, how they would blame themselves afterwards for missing that last opportunity of watching with their wrestling Lord, right? They would beat themselves up for it later. And so fervent prayer loves privacy, and Christ by this teaches us that secret prayer is our duty. He went away and prayed. And so he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Uh, they could not keep them open. 
Was there nothing, um, was there no influence here from the powers of darkness, perhaps? And so, prayed a third time, saying the same word. So this is going to show us that it's not unspiritual to make the same request to God several times. Some hyper-spiritual people believe that if we ask for something more than once, then it's going to prove that we don't have faith. They say to be true for some in, in uh, some situations, but Jesus is going to show us that repeated prayer can be completely consistent with steadfast faith. And so Jesus knew Jude, uh, Judas and those who would arrest him were on the way. He could have run and escaped the agony waiting for him at the cross, but Jesus rose to meet Judas, and he was in complete control of all the events. Verse 47 through 50. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one, sees him. And immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And so they clearly regarded Jesus as a dangerous man, and they came to take him with great force, with swords and clubs. And uh, Judas, perhaps he led the soldiers first to the upper room, and when he had found that the, uh, Jesus and the disciples were not there, uh, he could guess where they could be. And so Judas knew where to find them. Jesus could easily have foiled his plan by choosing a different place for this night, but this was not his intention. And those that are skilled in the Jewish learning are going to tell us that the ordinary guard of the temple belonged to the priests and such officers as they employed. Uh, But upon their great festivals, the Roman governors added bands of soldiers who were yet under the command of the priest. And so Judas warmly greets Jesus, even giving him this customary kiss, but the kiss only precisely identified Jesus to the authorities who came to arrest Jesus. And there are no more hollow, hypocritical words in the Bible than greetings rabbi in the mouth of Judas. The loving, heartfelt words of Jesus calling Judas a friend are going to stand in sharp contrast. And so... He kissed him, and so he kissed him heartily. And what a tremendous contrast between the woman in Simon's house in Luke 7 and Judas. Both kissed Jesus fervently with strong emotion, yet the one could have died for him, and the other betrays him to death. And so this sign of Judas was typical of the way in which Jesus is generally betrayed. When men intend to undermine the inspiration of the scriptures, How do they begin their books? Well, always with the declaration that they wish to promote the truth of Christ. And Christ's name is often slandered by those who make a loud profession of attachment to him. And then they sin foully as the chief of transgressors. And so they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. This only happened after they had all fallen to the ground when Jesus announced himself as the I Am in John 18 verse 6. In that passage, they stand up and he says, I am. And they're all blown back. And so it's strange that after this, that they should even dare approach him. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Verse 51 through 56. And suddenly, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? In that hour Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. And so Matthew doesn't tell us, but we know from John chapter 18 verse 10, 
which says, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear, that this unnamed swordsman was Peter. Unnamed in this account of Matthew. Named in John 18. Okay. <clears throat> and so... Jesus said, you know, uh, he would provide me with 12 legions of angels. Had Jesus wanted divine help at this moment, he could have it. There were more than 12 legions of angels ready to come at his aid. And a legion is judged to be about 6,000 foot and uh, 700 horses. And this great army of angels is by prayer uh, dispatched from heaven in an instant. The number is impressive, especially considering that one angel killed up to 185,000 soldiers in one night, right? You don't mess with angels. I'm going to bring up the 2 Kings chapter 19 account when it talks about um, when Assyria pushed through all the way to the southern kingdom and got beaten back by one angel. And that passage in 2 Kings 19 verse 35 will read, And it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when the people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. And so we don't mess with angels. So Jesus definitely had the ability if he wanted it, but he wanted to fulfill the scriptures. And so with one sword, Peter was willing to take a small, uh, take on a, a small army of men. Yet he couldn't pray with Jesus for just one hour. Prayer is the best work that we can do, and it's often the most difficult. With the sword, Peter accomplished very little. He only cut off one ear and really just made a mess that uh, Jesus had to clean up by healing the severed ear. And he does that in Luke 22, verse 51. And when Peter, when, uh, Peter moved in the power of the world, he only cut off ears. But when he, moved, when he was filled with the Spirit using the Word of God... Peter pierced hearts for God's glory in Acts 2, verse 37 at Pentecost. And so at, at the moment when it seemed that Jesus had nothing and no advantage, he knew that he still had a Father in heaven and access to his Father and all of his resources through prayer. <clears throat> and with all that power at his disposal, Jesus was in total command. He was not a victim of circumstance but he managed circumstances for the fulfillment of prophecy. And so at this point, all the disciples scattered. They ran for their own safety. A few, Peter and John at least, followed back to see what would happen at a distance. None of them stood beside Jesus and said, I've given my life to this man. What you accuse him of, you may accuse me of also. Instead, it was fulfilled what Jesus said, all of you will be made to stumble because of me. In Matthew 26, verse 31. Verse 57 and 58, Jesus is taken to the home of Cephas. Verse 57, and those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Cephas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard, and he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. And so this was not the first appearance of Jesus before a judge or official on the night of his betrayal. On that night and day of his crucifixion, and Jesus actually stood in trial several times before several different judges. Before Jesus came to the home of Siaphas, the official high priest, he was led to the home of Annas, who was the ex-high priest and the power behind the throne of the high priest, according to John 18, uh, verse 12 through 14 and 19 through 23, right? The power behind. He was really pulling the strings, so to speak, telling people what, how to, things should run. And so where the scribes and elders were assembled, Siaphas had gathered a group of the Sanhedrin to pass judgment on Jesus, this, re this religious uh, leadership. And so after the break of dawn, the Sanhedrin gathered again, this time in official session, and they conducted the trial described in Luke 22 verse 66 through 71 and so Peter was determined to prove wrong Jesus prediction that he would deny and forsake him at his death he followed him at a distance to see the end verse 59 through 61 the first trial before the Sanhedrin verse 59 now the chief priests the elders and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death but found none 
Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And so this nighttime trial was illegal, according to the Sanhedrin's own laws and regulations. They were breaking their own rule. And according to Jewish law, all criminal trials must begin and end in the daylight. Therefore, though the decision to condemn Jesus was already made, they conducted a second trial in daylight in Luke 22, verse 66 through 71, because they knew the first one, the real trial, had no legal standing. And this was only one of many uh, illegal illegalities that uh, that were made in the trial of Jesus. There were a ton that they broke their own uh, many rules. So according to Jewish law, only decisions made in the official meeting place were valid. So that first trial was held in the home of Siaphas, the high priest. According to Jewish law, criminal cases could not be tried during the Passover season. According to Jewish law, only an acquittal could be issued on the day of the trial. Guilty verdicts had to wait one night to allow for feelings of mercy to rise. According to Jewish law, all evidence had to be guaranteed by two witnesses who were separately examined and could not have uh, they could not have contact with each other. And according to Jewish law, false witness was punishable by death. Nothing was done to the many false witnesses in Jesus' trial. And according to Jewish law, a trial always began by bringing forth evidence for the innocence of the accused before the evidence of guilt was offered, and that was not the practice that was done here. Verse 62 through 64, Jesus is going to testify this trial. Verse 62, And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, Hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And so seeing this trial going badly, Siaphas confronted Jesus, acting more as an accuser than an impartial judge. And I adjure you is a rare and formal expression. Uh, 1 Kings 22 verse 16 uh, is going to give a, a similar Old Testament formula and is going to invoke the name of God in order to compel a true answer. And this is therefore the climax of the hearing. And so the high priest, frustrated by Jesus' silence, tried a bold stroke that cut to the central issue. Was Jesus the Messiah or was he not? 65 verse 65 through 68 the Sanhedrin are going to react with horror and brutality. Verse 65. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? And they answered and said, He is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him, and others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you. All right? Who is the one who struck you? And so this accusation of blasphemy would have been correct, except that Jesus was whom he said he was, and it's no crime for the Christ, the Son of God, to declare who he really is. And their verdict is going to reveal the depths of man's depravity. God, in total perfection, came to earth, lived among men, and this was man's reply to God. And so they spit on him, they hit him with their fists, they slapped him with their open hands, and it's easy to think that they did this because they didn't know who he was. And that is true in one sense, because they would not admit to themselves that he was indeed the Messiah and the Son of God. Yet in another sense, it's not true at all, because by nature, man is an enemy of God. And Romans chapter 5 verse 10 will say, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. And Colossians 1 verse 21 will say, And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he, God, has reconciled. So for a long time, men waited to literally hit 
slap and spit in God's face. And so Spurgeon suggested some ways that men still spit in the face of Jesus. They spit in his face by denying his deity, by rejecting his gospel, by preferring their own righteousness, and by turning away from Jesus. And as these religious leaders vented their hatred, fear, and anger upon Jesus, spitting in his face and beating him, it's remarkable that the immediate judgment of God did not rain down from heaven. It's remarkable that a legion of angels did not spring to the defense of Jesus. This is going to show the amazing amazing forbearance towards sin that God has and the staggering riches of his mercy. Verse 69 through 75. Right? So fearing association uh, association with Jesus, Peter is going to deny his relationship with Jesus three times. Verse 69. Now Peter sat outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied with an oath. I do not know the man. And a little later, those who came by up and said to Peter, Surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. And then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. So Peter was not questioned before a hostile court or even an angry mob. Peter's own fear made a servant girl and another girl hostile monsters in his eyes, and he bowed in fear before them. And so Peter's sin of denying his association with Jesus grew worse with each denial. First, he merely lied. Then he took an oath to the lie. Then he began to curse and swear. Okay, we can see how sin takes us along a path, and it gets worse the more we commit to it. And so those who stood by, those were loungers seeing Peter's confusion. They were amusing themselves by tormenting him. And so the Galileans spoke with a burr, and so ugly was their accent that no Galilean was allowed to pronounce the benediction at a synagogue service. Oh, man. And so... And, as if it would help distance himself from association with Jesus, uh, Peter began to curse and swear, right? To call down curses on himself, a sign of irritation and desperation, uh, or has lost self-control completely, as the text would imply. So when we hear that kind of language, we normally assume that person is not a follower of Jesus. And so he's trying everything he can to, to fit in uh, with the world at this point, to be like, I'm not, I'm not with Christ, I'm, I'm like you guys. And so Peter finally remembered and took heart to uh, what Jesus said. Uh, But in this case, he did it too late. For now, all he could do was weep bitterly. Yet Peter would be restored later, showing a significant contrast between Judas, who showed apostasy, and Peter, who showed backsliding. So apostasy is giving up the truth, as Judas did. Judas was sorry about his sin, but it was not a sorrow which led to repentance. Backsliding is a decline from spiritual experience once enjoyed. Peter slipped, but he will not fall. His bitter weeping will lead to his repentance and restoration. And so this was the beginning of Peter's repentance. He wept bitterly. Several things brought him to this place. The loving look of Jesus brought Peter to repentance. Luke tells us that just after the rooster crowed, that the Lord turned and looked at Peter in Luke 22, verse 61. The gift of remembering brought uh, Peter to repentance. Peter remembered the words of Jesus. Okay? And our memories serve us much in the business of repentance. We should rely on his word, and these verses should come to mind. Okay, and you can find more study material at taylorbiblestudy.com.